Everyone has a different reason for why they carry and even what they carry. And whether you're just a collector, a maker, or someone who really uses their shit, we want to hear your story. Welcome to the Carry Culture Podcast. Hey everyone, Josh here with Carry Culture. And today we've got a special episode featuring Chris Ortiz of Cerberus Knives. And I've got my co-host here, Chris. What's going on today, Chris? How are you? I'm doing good, man. Coming in off this Thanksgiving weekend. I'm a little full. How about you? Yeah, same, man. Same. Definitely trying to recover. Uh, today, uh, again, we've got Chris Ortiz with Cerberus Knives. Chris, how are you, man? Thanks. Thanks for I'm being doing here. Well. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, would you mind just taking a second to tell us a bit about Cerberus Knives and how all that came to be? Yeah, totally. Um, so my my introduction into knives actually was uh, I worked as I, I had a job when I was 17 and I worked with uh, a neighbor down the street, actually. And it was construction work. So one of the guys who worked on the site told me like, hey, you should get a knife for work. It's going to be useful. I said, totally. He's like, but don't spend more than 20 bucks on it. Cause you're going to lose it. I was like, all right. So that was, yeah, I know. Right. Crazy. Um, so that was kind of like my intro into knives. I was doing manual labor. We were doing a lot of like facial repair for uh, residential homes in a city near me. So I did that for a few months and it was cool. And then I went back to school, did my senior year, didn't really think about knives. And then when I was like 18, 19, I had a buddy and, uh, he asked me, he's like, do you carry a knife? I told him no. And he gave me a little Kershaw shuffle. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one. Yeah, it's uh, it was lime green, had the bottle opener on the back and a little like, you know, drop point blade with the swedge on it. It was a black blade, lime green handle, all black hardware. And uh, I carried that for a while and I ended up uh, getting a job as a window washer. And so it sounds funny, but knives are actually kind of an important part of that job because you have all these squeegees and they're all different sizes. And so when you go back to like mother base, where we'd get all our stuff and get our routes for the day, there'd be a giant roll of rubber. And most of us, what we were encouraged to do was measure out the rubber, cut a piece for the squeegee that you wanted, maybe cut it two pieces or three pieces, and then, you know, go about your day, do your route. But because there was never enough rubber, we'd all go in there and we'd just take a bunch of the roll and we'd cut it, you'd throw it in your bag. And then when you were out on town doing jobs, if something happened, you need a fresh rubber, you just bust out a knife or a razor blade, and sit down, cut the rubber to size, trim it, get it inside your squeegee, and then go about your day. So uh, I ended up being like pretty reliant on a knife for the three years I did that. And uh, like during that time, I was using a lot of my free time to like mod knives. So I had a, a garage, but I didn't have any tools in it really. And I started buying like spider coats, like PM2s, para threes. Uh, guys like Nick Maffei were like a really big inspiration. I don't know if you know who Nick is, but. Uh, he's the guy who created the para three skinny. So like that skinny shape that we have on the para three is mm. all the result of like his modding work. He was oh, like, he really okay. kicked it off along with this guy, uh, Rick Walker from Walker customs. So I like stumbled on these guys the one day on Instagram and I didn't really use Instagram, but I saw like, Oh, there's these guys that, you know, they, they trick out knives. So they do copper washes and they, you know, do heat colored hardware. And so I was like, it seems cool. Like I'd love to do that in my free time. So started buying knives, got like a really cheap kind of garbage Harbor freight blast cabinet. And like a neighbor down the street had like a little pancake compressor. He let me borrow and I would go and I'd sandblast these knives and I'd acid wash them and I'd blast and tumble them. And, you know, I'd put like crowning on the spine or do just, you know, all these little things, just these little details. And, uh, it kind of just like morphed from there. Like just, it kind of just started to compound and compound and compound and, Eventually we got into scales and then it kind of just took off. That's awesome. Nice. Uh, yeah. Hearing the whole story. That's, that's funny. Yeah. So you, uh, you had just a, that, that was in high school. You had that job originally. Uh, which, uh, so, so yeah. Yeah. Cause you mentioned you got a $20 knife. That wasn't the, the Kershaw, was it? No. So the Kershaw was a gift from a friend. So I got like some, probably like some cheap, like Smith and Wesson. And like, we were just okay. beating on our stuff when I was working that job in high school. And it was my, from my junior to my senior year, like that summer I worked that job. So, you know, it was a good job. Uh, I got paid cash, like under the table. It was great for like a 17 year old kid. Yeah. I was yeah. off by three 30, you know, nice. like, uh, so sunny Southern California. Like it's, it's, it was hard to be angry. Um, yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. I would imagine for a 17 year old, that's 
Yeah, it was awesome. And the guy who owned the company has been my neighbor for 20 years at that point, or like 18 years at that point. So it was just real comfortable. It was like a good like entry point into the workforce, kind of just seeing how things worked and like, you know, having a routine and having some sort of responsibility. So uh, I did that for a while and then I couldn't carry a knife at school. So they kind of just got pushed to like to the back of my mind. I didn't really think about them. Right. And, uh, you know, after I finished my senior year, I was kind of unsure that I want to go to college and I want to just work. I ended up getting just a job that I was going to do part time with the idea being that I was going to use a spare time to go to school. Um, I okay. wanted to go double major as a mechanical engineer with, uh, with electrical engineering too. So I have a bunch of engineers in my family. So it seemed like the most natural like progression. Seems like a serious degree. You don't hear a lot of that. No, but like I have a cousin who's an engineer who's like five years my senior and he's done everything from like, he spent a year blowing up car batteries just to figure out if they could like stop one cell in a battery from affecting all the other cells when it goes bad. Wow. So yeah, it's just like, what kind of job is that, dude? You're making like 95 grand a year and you're blowing up batteries in a shipping container for a living. It's like, that sounds pretty Very fun, cool. dude. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How do I do that? So you were working as the window washer, uh, as a window washer for three years. Did you go from that to being a knife maker? Is that your, your next step? You went to be a, your own business owner and kind of step out of the workforce? Yeah. The cool part of window washing was where I worked, they would give us like routes. So it was really nice not having like a boss. Like he didn't follow me around town. It was like, go, go to this place today, wash these windows at all these different stores, get all these, these papers signed bring them back. Like you'll get 30% of the work. So the idea was like, if you did $330 worth of work for the day, it was a hundred bucks. So it, it wasn't bad. Um, and you could do more work or you could do less work. It was kind of up to you. Um, but the, I, I had like a pretty, I had a pretty good spot there. So I ended up being the guy who picked up like all the power washing work cause we would do like light power washing for a bunch of the companies. And we had contracts with all of these stores to do power washing and nobody wants a guy power washing at 9am when you open your doors. So I'd be getting up at like four, four thirty, and I'd go to the office, grab my truck, grab my route, grab all my supplies, load the power washer and all the other tools in the back of the truck. And then I'd bang through a bunch of these power washing jobs before nine o'clock. And they were like fairly beefy jobs in terms of payouts. So I could make like, you know, 150 bucks, 200 bucks, but I'd be getting off by 1030 in the morning. So it's like, what do you do with all that free time? Yeah. You know, find something that you you're passionate about and, and pursue it. So I ended up, that's how I kind of got into modding the knives. I was like, I get home at 1030. I have a whole day to burn basically. So I might as well just start messing around and figuring out like how all this works. And so it just, like I said, it compounded. Um, like from there we went into, I had a good computer. I had built a computer like maybe three years prior to me getting into knives, uh, like full custom build, you know, bought a case, loaded everything in, handpicked out all the parts, mashed everything in there together. And uh, I was just using it for like random stuff, playing video games, you know, going on the internet, doing whatever. And uh, fortunately I did that because it's what opened up the door to Fusion 360, which was essentially like the, the building blocks of what it, like what got me to here now. Like fusion is like the base that I built everything else off of. Right. Yeah. You probably need a pretty powerful computer for that sort of work. I would imagine rendering. It, yeah. It varies. Like for the most part, it's like it, it, fusion will play nice, but let's say you have a sketch, right. And there's all these like bisecting lines and like all these lines have a set distance in between each other. Yeah. Like a grid pattern. Let's say like a diamond pattern, like a checkering pattern all those points have a relationship to one another. And if you want to move that entire sketch and shift it over, the computer has to do all this math to make sure that the ratio of the points of them being however far they are from each other, that'll like piss my computer off. Yeah, That's when it gets sure. to the point where it's like, we're trying to process all this information at one in one shot and it, it can get a little hairy. Yeah. Definitely slows the PC down. I would imagine. How do you, how do you come up with them? Oh, uh, well, I'm obviously a spider co guy. And so uh, I wanted to do something that was based around like a bug or an animal. I thought that it was super cool that when you buy a spider co, it's got the spider on the logo. It seems like real iconic. Okay. So there was like kind of some of the seeds there, but I also grew up reading stuff like, you know, like I was like 12 when I read the Odyssey. So it made like a pretty big impact yeah. on my life. Yeah. 
Um, and I'm actually reading the Iliad right now, which is one that I never got to tackle when I was younger. Nice. Um, but I was just like always really into the Greek mythology stuff. So like the, the pit bull I got was named Zeus and we had him for like a couple years and he died like shortly after I started Cerberus. Um, but that, that pit bull head that you see on the logo, it's actually, it's done after him. Wow. That's oh, nice. so cool. My dog's name yeah. is Ares, by the way. Really? That's sick. And his brother's name is Zeus. That's sick. Yeah. yeah. So Funny I had a, Oh, you have Corsos? Damn. Those are big dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's over there sleeping, lazy ass. My pit bull was like some sort of mutt breed. So he looked like a pit bull, but he was a hundred pounds, which oh. is from my understanding, like not what most pit bulls get to. That's a big dog. Yeah. He had like a cinder block for a head, dude. He was real big. Um, he was really nice though. He was cool. Uh, so it was just like kind of all these things that came together and then it, it kind of worked out. Cause as I've gotten older, I've started to have a, an appreciation for like some of like the, like some of the Greek philosophers in particular. So like it kind of all ties back in together where it's like, oh, I was into this. And then like from this, this interest I had with the mythology, I kind of learned about all these other guys that, that did things. Um, in ancient Greece. Yeah. And so it kind of just like ended up working out pretty well. I got a couple of books here from those days, right here somewhere. Right on. Marcus Aurelius. And I'm trying to find the slap you sent in the last uh, riot. It was like, I, it was the dog. Yeah. It was like hol- kind of uh, like holographic kind of looking. I, I think my daughter yeah. took it, dude. I've got a toddler who loves stickers. <laughs> Anytime I have cool stickers, she jacks them, dude. I, I think she took it. But I was gonna here, I think I got one right here. Ass like that. I guess that was your dog. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah. So you made it in the drawing there. It's like a chunkier dog. I guess that's supposed to represent your hundred. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. How cool. Yeah, it's a. Uh... It's cool. It's like, uh, he, he went too early. He got nose cancer. So, um, yeah, we got him when I was like, it's all good, bro. It's, it's been a couple years now. So it's like, it is what it is. You know, they, we have a tendency to outlive our dogs, which is the unfortunate part about dogs. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he got nose cancer. Like I think like three years after we got him, we got him as a pup and then we gave him chemo. He kicked it for another year, came back. We gave him chemo again. And then that after that second round, he lived for another year. And then towards the end, it was just like, it was the right thing to do. So we ended up taking him to the vet. We put him down. It was, uh, yeah, it was a bummer, but I mean, that's, that's the nature of dogs. Uh, that, that's really sad. I mean, very tragic. Yeah, man. I love how yeah. you've, uh, honored him in your business though. Your yeah. Life. That's awesome. Dude. Really awesome. Yeah. It was, it's cool. So it's like, he's gone. He's not forgotten though. It's cool. You know, right. He lives on. You've been in knife making now for quite some time. You've done scales. You got into knives. What are some of the most challenging things that you faced um, in the knife making game? I think the hardest thing has been like, and I can't take full credit for this. I have, so I have my buddy Alex at a face this, uh, who's like really taken, you know, the, the lead in this aspect, but it's uh, it's like developing process, right? So making a knife once, you know, maybe with the grinder and angle grinder, like, you know, using a small wheel to clean up the edges, grinding it is, is great. But how do you design and build a process out where you can do things repeatedly? That's been like our biggest hurdle is like, is ironing that out in particular, like the scales, probably a great example. When we used to make the scales, we'd make them, you know, we'd make one set at a time. So we'd make the sheet, we'd get like all these, you know, a bunch of sets in the sheet and we'd machine everything. And then we'd cut them out and we'd have like individual scales. So you'd have a stack of left scales and a stack of right scales. Then they'd go and they'd clip into these things called soft jaws. Soft jaws, like uh, it's two pieces of aluminum and it's custom machined. So that way it fits the shape of the part that you want to put in there. And then you tighten the jaw down and it holds the part. And then you can come in and you can do, you know, the top face. You can put in all the chamfers and all the counter bores or the counter sinks and all the patterns. Right. And it worked well as a process. There was some inconsistencies in it. There was some variables that we weren't super pleased with that we wanted to iron out. And, uh, it took us, I think like six months to make the jump from the soft jaws and I'm six months of downtime. Like we shut down the whole operation. We didn't make any scales. We 
just took all our time and energy and efforts and we like redesigned the entire process on how on how everything was made. Um, and like the MAFB is a result of like our learning progression. When I designed the, the, the mini arena fixed blade, uh, there's a bunch of things in that knife that like aren't very suited to our manufacturing process. And so like the riot is a direct result of like all the things that we learned about manufacturing knives and about design work and about fixturing and process and just, just everything about it was implemented in the riot, which is why it's become like significantly easier for us to make than something like the MAFB. Um, in particular, the bevels, like the bevels give me a real hard time on the MAFB, whether I'm grinding them or we do them on the machine, it, it's tricky. So it seems like consistency is, is kind of the big issue. Yeah. It's how to build something that is consistent. I think it's why guys like Bill Koenig or Daniel Oz, right. Are, are so impressive. It's like, all of these are consistent. Yeah. yeah. Everything feels right. Like it's, you're not, it's not like an accident. This feels the way it feels. It feels this way because that's how Bill wants it to feel. Um, and I think there's like something like beautiful about that. Right. It's like somebody who spends all the mental energy yeah. to build out this process and like refine things to the point where they feel as good as an Arius. Uh, like it is, it's, it's what I desire. So that's what I want to be at is I want to be building knives that are consistent. You know what you're buying as a customer. And as far as like the manufacturing side, we're eliminating as much waste and as much like headache as we possibly can. So would you say, consistency is still an issue that you're having or is it something that you see that you are improving on and it's you're getting it dialed down it's definitely still a challenge it's getting better like the scales are something that we don't not necessarily we don't pay too much like mind to it's just like that process has been worked out enough over the last two or three years that we're pretty confident like when we go into there things are going to work now that being said nothing's ever a hundred. So sometimes you make stuff and it's, it's not perfect and you scrap a sheet or you throw away this, or you throw away that. But, uh, the big issue right now is like bevels. So like choke points in knife manufacturing seem to be like bevels in particular seem to be a really, really hard choke for a lot of guys. Um, there's a couple ways to do them. Some of the options are better than others. The most common one that you'll see in like a Chinese manufacturing house is called a bevel grinder. It's called a Seatman is who makes the one we've looked at. They're really expensive. I think they're, I could be wrong. A quarter million dollars a machine might be wow. like in the wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. That is no um, joke. No. And um, it's. Would you, would you explain to our viewers what uh, the bevel is really quick? Just for something. You don't know. So the bevel is this taper right here, right? So you have the, the grind. And then this area here is your bevel. So you can see the flat up here and then here's your bevel, right? So it's the taper from the, the full thickness all the way down to the cutting edge. And there's a bunch of different ways to, to do a bevel, right? You can like grind it like on the grinder behind me, or you can yeah. use a seatman. Um, but there's a couple other ways that guys do it. You can machine the bevels like Grimsmo uh, or like Stein grabber machines his hard right? So he's hard milling in the bevels and there's varying schools of thought, like why you would do it in one state or in another. But for the most part, it seems that grinding them hard is the most preferred way to do it. The reason why is that steel will move and heat treat when you get a piece of steel up to, you know, like 2200 or 2150, whatever it is that Magna Cut likes to ostentize at. Uh, it gets hot and it moves and it shifts and holes will kind of move around a little bit. And so when you're grinding things post, now the steel is not going to move. If you were to grind a blade soft and then send it to heat treat, there's a good chance that it starts to move around and that you get inconsistencies. So the, the way that what, our opinion, mine and Alex's Alex from Hephaestus is that the best way to like skin that cat is to work from like a pre-hardened blank. So you get a knife blanket, you harden it, and then you do your surface grinding, you do your bevel grinding, you grind in your lock bar for your like, you know, your, your lock up. All of that should be done in a hardened state. Even things like stop pins, like if you have a stop pin track in your blade or you have a pin that's set inside of a handle and you have a, a point of contact on your actual blade where the pin and the blade meet, that should probably be done post heat treat because now the steel is not going to move. So right. it's like you're, you're giving yourself the best chance of having accuracy when you're doing that. So, yeah, yeah, the bevels in particular are a concern and, uh, we've toyed with the idea of doing a folding knife. Obviously I've designed a couple folders, so 
it makes the most sense that we'd progress to that at some point. Um, I'm a bit concerned about how the titanium is going to move. I've talked to a lot of different makers about how they feel about, you know, the tie. Does it move? Are you concerned about it? And a lot of guys tell me like, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. So it's like, that's going to be another spot where process really needs to get ironed out to make sure that, you know, you're having consistency when you go from one fixture to the next and making sure that everything fits together the correct way. So you've expressed some of the challenges you face as a knife, knife maker. What are some of the, some of your favorite materials to work with in terms of like steel or even scale materials? I like S90 V as far as like blade steels go. I'm a big fan of S90, but I hate grinding it. So I don't know if I'd say I necessarily like working with it. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, two sides to every coin. One of the things that's nice about S90 is that because it's so hard, it's a little bit harder to make a mistake. Like if you move a little bit oh, wrong on the grinder, I see. It's a little more forgiving. Yeah. In that sense. It's a little more yeah. forgiving. Yeah. Um, three V is a great steel. I've always liked three V. So I think it's solid, uh, it grinds pretty well and it's, it, it has that toughness that I really enjoy. I, I beat on my knives a lot. So having something that's a little bit more impact resistant seems to be uh, more favorable for someone like me. As far as like handle materials, I, uh, it's kind of cliche, but I like my card a lot. Um, G10 is cool, but I've noticed that G10, uh, I don't always love the way the layers show. And so something like linen micarta seems to really show, um, like a lot of, like a lot of character in the layers, but, and it also has like a finer grain. So I think it looks a lot cleaner than canvas. Um, it looks a little bit more uniform and a little bit more refined, a little bit more elegant. So I'd, I'd probably say like, as far as handles go, linen my car just seems to be like pretty high up there. As far as users go, I enjoy titanium quite a bit, but I haven't worked with it enough to say whether or not I like it. Do you plan on making swappable scales for any of your fixed blades? Like separate ones that we can just buy if we want to swap things out? I definitely would like to. Um, one of the things I would like to do prior to that, and it's something that Alex and I have talked about at length, it's on our short list of stuff to get done, would be to uh, figure out how to make the sheaths in a mold. So when I make the sheaths right now, everything's made like one at a time. I have, I don't, I actually you might be able to see it. There's a sheath press right here. So okay. it's a piece of foam. Right. And you heat up the Kydex, you jam it in there and then you jam the knife in and you orient it the right way. And then when it cools, you have a sheath and then you go and you drill it, you cut it, you grind it. Right. And that's how you get it. Um, some guys have figured out how to do it where they'll take like a bunch of like Delrin or like machinable plastic and they machine both sides of their knife. They lay them out a certain way. And then you can take a giant piece of Kydex, like a, a foot by foot, heat the whole thing up. Then you take it, you put it on all over these molds and then you have a vacuum table. And it sucks all the kydex down and it, it it gives you like a perfect fit. And then on that same in that same process, you have a router come in or or a, or a CNC, whatever you want, and you drill all the holes for the sheaths. And then you just take a heat strip, you can bend it and bolt everything together, and now you have a consistent sheath. So mm. I'd like to have sheaths consistent because then the handles will all fit consistently inside of it. And so then you don't have customers where it's like one guy gets a sheath and it fits perfect. Then another guy gets a sheath and it's a little bit loose. Right. It's like, I want everything that to fit sense. together like perfectly. So that way, if you buy a set of handles and you bolt them on, it's like everything fits the way it's supposed to fit. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, it, you don't want to run into issues of having to swap them out or even just have somebody have a bad experience because they purchased it. Uh, but which sort of goes into my next question. Actually, I was going to ask you as sort of a one man team, how do you balance like social media, customer service, the design aspect, making the knives and everything that everything else that goes into your operation? So having Alex from a face, this is like massive, right? Uh, having someone who handles like a lot of the front end stuff for me is, is huge. Uh, it gives me more, more flexibility with how I need to use my time. And it's also beneficial because usually both of us are running down a different thread. So like Alex might be running down one problem and figuring that out. And then at the same time, I'll be running down a completely different set of issues. And so it's like, it's, it's a two pronged attack, which makes everything a lot easier in terms of staying on top of stuff. So that's a, a big portion of it. That's made it easier. Uh, but also it just, it just varies day to day. Like I think 
most days when I wake up, I just, I'm worried about what the most pressing thing is. So like if I had a drop, the most pressing thing is shipping all the knives. That's like priority numero uno. Uh, as far as customer service goes, I'm fortunate that I don't have to deal with a lot of upset customers. Uh, so far I have some scales that come back from time to time that need warranty work, uh, which is no biggie. We, we overproduce everything that we make now by not, not like a, a bunch, but I'll always have like usually four to five extra sets kind of floating around that I'll either give out if, if time goes on long enough or I'll, you know, I'll use or I'll, I'll do whatever with, but for the most part, I have a back stock of extra scales. So it's like, if something comes back and it's wrong, it's like, I get an email, Hey, I'm having an issue. It's always just like, send me your address and I'll send you a new set of scales. Right, uh, that's yeah. a much easier solution than like, I'm not going to, what am I going to argue with the customer and tell them like, Oh, well you did this wrong. It's like, that. yeah, yeah. No, nah, don't worry about it, bro. Just send me your address and I'll just get you a new set of scales. Like, however much money I spend in scales is probably well spent considering that like, we're going to have a good experience now. Now you're not going to be mad because you know, yeah. I back up my stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. That seems like the right thing to do too. So. Yeah. It just, it makes a lot of sense. Like I just, I don't want to argue with anybody. It's like, if you had a bad time, I got you covered. And luckily it doesn't happen a ton. Like I'll, sometimes I go months without getting an email Awesome. as far as customer service stuff goes. So it's like, it, I think part of that too is like making sure the process is good and, making sure what you're making is good. And then you, your likelihood of having to deal with stuff like that drops like pretty dramatically. Yeah. Quality product. And then just going back and doing some QC just to make sure everything's good before it gets sent out. Yeah. I could see why it, you know, you don't have those emails very often. We also, and this is a, all credit to Alex, but when we're making the scales, he'll make them on the machine. And then before like everything that's critical happens the first time we put the, the material in the machine. So like the pocket getting machined, all the holes being put in, all of that's done before, like that's the first thing that's done in the process. What that means is that when we finish making the batch, before we go and we do the top side, we'll take a liner from a PM2 or a pair of three, whatever it is we're making, and we'll actually fit it in. And we'll double check it on the machine to make sure everything fits right. And if it doesn't, then we just go in and we'll rerun whatever we need to rerun and we'll add just like a little bit of clearance. And like, we'll just keep walking out our clearance until everything fits the way it's supposed to. Nice. Let's talk about inspiration. Where do you get your inspiration from knife making? What are some of your favorite makers? Fuck, I could, I could rattle on forever, dude. Um, we got time. Yeah, I could, I could, I could go on forever on, uh, on like who I like. I think guys like Ray Laconico, right? I showed this off earlier. I don't know if... It'll be in the video, but Ray's got, um, I think a really great style. It's like very clean. It's like elegant in my opinion. Uh, it's no frills, but it like, it looks good. So this knife feels like it'd be just as home, like on a work site as it would in maybe like a set of dress slacks, maybe in a little bit more of a dressier occasion. I can so see that. maybe not, yeah, maybe not formal, but I think it does well all around. And he, his execution of the things that I think matter the most are, are there like the contouring good. It feels good in the hand, the shape, the handle, uh, blade geometry, blade profile, overall profile. I think he really excels. And I think he has like that very like clean, minimal aesthetic that I, I really enjoy. And that I try and bring into my knives. So he's definitely one of them guys like, uh, Shirogorov are definitely like a big inspiration their milling patterns the way that they dress up their faces like the little details that they put into knives i think is like super major they, i think they set kind of like the the baseline for what it means to have like high-end milling in a knife this one is a cheaper version so it doesn't have as many of the features as you might see in some of the the higher end production versions or even like the custom divisions but right. Uh, I really enjoy just like how they dress things up, how they add like little sweeps, you know, um, like, you know, distinction here, there's micro milling here. There's like mill lines here and then it's smooth here. Right. Things like, you know, they put sort of a backspacer. There's three pins. Like, yeah, that's really unique. cool. Just the little details, yeah. all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking to kind of tie in that minimalistic look with, uh, sort of their like little flair and design that they throw in exactly and like if you look at the clip on this one there's mill lines on the side of the clip like up here there's mill lines on that angle and then the clip has an angle in it i don't even know if oh, i can show I it on that. camera wow but oh, it's got an yeah. it, so, so there's cool. a chamfer 
there's a chamfer oh, here shit. and then the clip and the chamfer like meet and that's like where the pinch point is is like where these two chamfers these two angles meet and it's like who even thinks of that stuff dude it's right. so trick yeah yeah really so detailed. Yeah, so I like them a lot. Uh, I would be lying if I said that Koenig isn't like a giant inspiration. I think just the Arius in particular has a lot of lines that I really, really enjoy. It's got smooth yeah. and hard angles at the same time. So I really like the Arius. Uh, Brown, Craig Brown. This thing, I, I this was my favorite knife for like a very long time. And I mean, Craig's got really great finishing work and design style, but there's something about this that just really spoke to me. It's like, it's slim and it's like clean. It's got the right aesthetic for me, the lines, the angles, like where he's putting things together. A lot of it just, it just works for me. So yeah, that's a beautiful I've mind. learned. Yeah. They're fantastic. And then also Maverick. So Maverick and guys like him and like CMF, I just really like their styles. Like they're clean, they're elegant. They're not overly busy, but they have, like soul and texture and they're not like blobby either i've noticed like some knives have this feeling where it just looks like someone drew like a knife in one continuous line and like everything works and it functions well and it looks fine but i think there needs to be like angles and points and like a bit right. of like just something that that's visually is interesting because you're making a tool but you're also making a piece of art so it, like the artistic you know it has to be there it has to shine through even though it's primarily designed as a tool. So, um, and then there's more guys, guys like Jason Arevalo, um, like really get me fired up. I have one of his customs. He makes this pry bar here. So he also makes a custom knife and there's not a ton of them out there, but I just really like the style. I'll look at that thing sometimes and I'll go like I almost kick myself or I go like, damn, like I'm, I'm upset that I didn't design that. Like that is so brilliantly done. Like the way you put everything together, it's like, yeah. I wish I made that. And uh, he's one of the guys that definitely has like that aspect to, to the designs that he does where I see them and I'm like, damn it, Jason. Like yeah. I need to steal that from you, bro. Like I need that dude. That's awesome. Or like at the very least I need to buy one. So yeah, it's inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like also just talking to other guys. Like, you know, you, you end up being a maker for long enough and you talk to some other dudes and it's like, you learn all these tricks and sometimes like manufacturing tricks or like all these other little tricks will affect like how you end up putting together the next knife that you design. So it can like vary from piece to piece. Interesting. And it's cool getting inspiration from a lot of these people and putting all these things together and then you get what you made. Exactly. That looks completely different from everyone, everyone else. Cause you've put so many like, things that you've learned and ideas together. And I try to be mindful of like, you learn something from somebody, but you don't want to like, you want to, you want to understand the essence of what makes that particular aspect of their knife. Great. But you want to figure out how to like make it your own and not just like take it and copy and paste it in. That's like where part of the fun is. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's huge, bro. That's a good mindset that you have. Cause a lot of people just take and then kind of just twist one thing. And it's like, yeah, grab a bit of this, grab a bit of that throw it together. Oh, it's my own design. It's like, no, that's like 10 yeah. people's design in one. Yeah. Yeah. And doing that can also affect like the cohesion of the, of the final piece. So it's like, sometimes you'll put a bunch in and then you have to go back through with an eraser and take a bunch out because it just doesn't right. fit with like what you're trying to build. Cause you want it to be tasteful too. Exactly. You're not trying to overdo the details. Yeah. And it's a minimalistic look like hey, you're things saying. can get you don't busy. want it to be too busy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, things get really busy. Uh, I've seen some knives where it's just like, it's very impressive that you were able to machine that. Like from a machinist yeah. standpoint, I'm like, that's crazy, dude. I don't know how you did that. But from like a, an appreciation standpoint, I'm like, if you would just cut out like a little bit of this, it would have looked a hell of a lot nicer. It looked like, right. you know, $300 more expensive because it just looks a little bit cleaner. Yeah, you know? just that yeah. subtlety goes a long way. Yeah. So you're showing off a, bu a bunch of stuff here, but I got to ask, what are you carrying today? What's in your pocket? So most days I carry, since I got this at CCKS, I've carried it. And some people probably are wondering like, and, and I'm carrying this, this riot. So this is a, a ABL riot. I think we did these at 64 Rockwell, which is why I ended up grabbing this one was I was just, I wanted to know what ABL was going to feel like and how it was going to perform at a higher Rockwell. Cause I've heard that it's, it feels much more premium in the higher Rockwells. And so far it's held up really well. Um, edge retention seems like solid on it 
I'm not having any chipping or any issues. And I've even like dropped it on concrete floors and I haven't had any problems. So, um, that's been nice. And I'm carrying it in the sheath that my buddy Taylor from Taylor by Cortez made. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but he actually stamps his name in there too, which is super cool. Nice. Nice. And I'll throw his Instagram is, handle up. They can, they can yeah, share. definitely do. Um, yeah, I, have a few I have one for the rest right. They're really, really good. And they break in really, really well. And what I like to do is because I don't have to carry it in the Kydex anymore. I actually put this in my back right pocket, like in the wow. in a corner. Yeah, and so and it's it. clip it in, yeah. it comes in and out with ease. Um, it looks nice. You know, you're not supposed to technically carry like a fixed blade concealed in California. So this makes it a lot less aggressive looking. A lot of people won't bat an eye right. when they see something like this sticking out of your back pocket. And then I generally have a pry bar. I'm always looking for a flathead in the shop. Um, things like with my air compressor, I'm supposed to be checking the oil like fairly regularly. And this one happens to have an air, an oil leak right now. So I'm constantly mm -hmm. looking for a flathead to crack open the case, double check my oil levels, just do stuff with it. So I carry this air volo pry bar. Um, and I've made pry bars, but I think there's something nice about carrying mm -hmm. something that somebody else made. Like, right. There's something special about it. I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you're you're a, a collector at heart. I mean, you're yeah. you appreciate all those details, like you said, and so it is cool to have somebody else's art, if you will, in your pocket and have that appreciation. Yeah, yeah. and I've uh, I met Jason through my buddy Rick from Walker Customs, and I ended up buying a knife a knife from him not too long ago, maybe a year ago, and it's far and away like one of the best knives I've ever handled, especially in, like in particular, the detent. I have yet to find a knife that rivals his detent. And I like, I wish I had it in front of me. It's actually out getting checked out by somebody else because I talk about it so much that I feel obligated to send it to other people. So that way they can see it. They can appreciate how good it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's like, I do, if I don't have an Aries in my pocket or like a Rosie or like a, you know, or like the prism, this is another one I carry a, a ton, which is, it's the only, only integral I actually own. Oh, damn. So yeah. that's, dope. that's beautiful. Yeah. It's all wow. one piece. It's got, it's a great user too. I use it. Um, zirconium inlay. It's got, I think it's a spanner number eight pivot for the pivot head. And then titanium clip, you know, titanium body RWO 34 with a hollow grind. And it's got a nice big swedge on it. It's got that minimalistic, but also it's got those little details in it. And it's not overdone. Exactly. Yeah, that's a beautiful Exactly. Thing. And Nick, uh, Maverick Concepts on Instagram for anyone who's curious. Um, I bought this from Nick maybe earlier this year at like CCKS Spring. And when I saw him at the show a couple of weeks ago for the fall show, by that point, he'd already gotten a new machine. He has like a new process set up or at least a more refined process. And I can't say it enough. These knives have gotten like head over heels better. Like this one's good. And the new ones are great. Like his detent feels well, was super good. The machining is all like crazy. It's super high end machining. He's doing a lot of like material removal and micro milling patterns and all these different features inside of them. And they are, really really good so i carry that one a lot too but today it's it's the arius and the riot and the pry bar very nice yeah you've got quite the collection man that's awesome I, i've been at it for a couple of years yeah 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 and it's i've started to collect um like uh like quality over quantity so like i'll spend i might only buy three or four knives in a year but i might buy you know each knife might be six seven eight hundred dollars so I'm getting really particular on what I'm buying and I'm leaning more towards buying like a lot of American made stuff. I like supporting, you know, other guys who produce knives here in the States. Cause I know that's what I would want. I want other people to support the work that I do here. And so uh, it sits just like a little better with me when I'm, if, even if it's $800 for the knife or like 855 for the areas, it's like, I'll buy it. I'll use it. It feels good. It's like a point of pride knowing that you're supporting somebody who's pursuing something that's as hard as, as knife making and then doing it at the level that he is. Right. Uh, right. so, and they're, they're also great users, right? Like a lot of guys will buy these and then not use them. And it's like, why spend this much money on a knife, not beat it up? Because if it breaks, it's a lot easier for me to get Bill to fix it because he's here in Idaho rather than like buying a $200 Chinese knife. And if it breaks, you're potentially SOL. Yeah. And their customer service is generally much better. Yes. 
and maybe it's just like a, a BS way for me to justify spending this much money on knives, right? Who knows? Yeah, but I, I could see it. But then again, you're you're speaking to Chris and me, and I mean, we're both knife guys, also. Right, right. So maybe <laughs> if I was talking to, to normal people, right, they may, yeah, they might be yeah. looking at me like I was crazy. But exactly. yeah, it's like I. I get some reassurance knowing that like if I spend a lot of money on a knife, like I'm going to use it and I'm probably going to do things with it that I'm not supposed to do with it. So it's nice having like that reassurance, like, Hey, you're going to fix this knife. I really like, right. And they're like, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like, all right, yeah. let's use it, man. Let's, let's just put it to work. Send it. K- Koenig is probably one of those knives. I wouldn't really even care about the price. Cause I've, you know, we've handled it. We know what it is. We know it's worth it. I wouldn't like mind. It's yeah. Great knife. Yeah. And it, even if Bill, let's say I broke this thing and I hit a bill and he was like, Hey, 200 bucks to fix it. I'd happily pay for it. Cause it's like, that's covering materials. It's covering labor. That's covering cost of time. It's covering like you talking to me. Cause like, you know, it's like someone as busy as him. I'm sure it's, you know, every second is worth time. It's worth money with him. Right. So, right. um, it's like you're paying for more than just like, there's, there's things that are intangible in that process that you don't see that you're paying for when you buy that, that, you know, that nicer knife. Yeah. 2024 is coming up right around the corner. Are there any goals or upcoming projects you would like to share with our viewers? Yeah. So I have three folding knife designs coming out next year. Wow. Um, yeah, I can only talk about two of them. So maybe, maybe not best that I mentioned the third, but it's, it's no biggie. I just won't say who it's with. Um, but I have one coming out with a, a friend of mine who runs a company in the industry and uh, I'm, I'm really excited for it. I just got first articles back and like, you know, the protos a couple months ago. So we nitpicked through it and we've kind of been going back and forth with, uh, with his people getting the design dialed in. There was a couple of things we wanted to nitpick with that one. And I'm not positive on when it's rolling out yet. It could be, you know, middle of next year. So that'll probably be the one that's farthest away. Uh, I have, two knives that are coming out with the face disc. One of them is a folder. And then one of them is a fixed blade. The fixed blades already been shown on the Instagram. So you guys might've seen it. Um, it's a, I wish I had one here. It's a stout, um, blade. It's a much bigger blade than what we normally make. It's real wide, very stout, um, tall bevel, the drop point, swedge, chimping. It's, it's fairly straightforward. It, it looks a bit like the Seder, but in a fixed blade format. So you it's going to have a lot of these. Group? the photo uh facebook and on instagram yeah okay, i'll try to find that and pop it up on the screen so they can see what you're talking cool. about Let me get video of you. cool um it's unnamed right now so i don't have really have a name for it but alex and i have been talking about it we had the first couple made but we so we use this guy for heat treat probably should get into this who he's he's near us and he has like a full heat treat facility the reason why we use him is that he has a vacuum furnace so, you know, most guys are heat treating in like an atmosphere oven, right? Like a, a regular, like even heat, you put the knife in the foil, put some powder in the bag, close it, throw it in the oven, let it soak, pull it out, quench it. Um, this guy has this giant heat treat oven and he lines the entire thing with knives or whatever we send them, And then it heat treats it. But instead of like having to pull them out, put them in our, not having them in a bag, having to pull them out, quench them. It has a tank of inert gas that he pumps into the, the chamber when they when they need to be quenched. And then while that's happening, he's sucking all the heat, all the hot air out. And he's, I don't even know what he does with it. Cause you have to cool that air. It's like, you know, 2000 degrees. So he must have wow. some crazy cooling system too. Yeah. Um, so we send a lot of our stuff to him. He ended up messing up that batch. And we're not sure if part of the reason is because it's magna cut magna cut seems to have a harder time. You just have to get it real hot to get it like as hard as people want. And it seems, and then you have to have a very rapid quench rate. So not only does the heat need to be super high, but you also have to cool it very, very quickly. So we sent him a batch of like 10 protos and he ended up messing up some of them. Some of them made it back, but we ordered new material and we're going to send it out to him along with another batch of steel we have. We're hoping that it comes out better this time. So definitely keep an eye out for those. The other fixed blade project, or I'm sorry, the other knife project I have with them rather is a folding knife. Uh, it's my design. I also designed the, all the fixtures, all the clamps, uh, the entire process. I programmed all the parts. So everything from, you know, just everything about that knife, I essentially designed and made, but it's going to be made on his machines and sold under his brand. And the idea here was that we wanted to test our process before I went out and bought a machine for myself 
So okay. he was like, why don't you license me a design and like you program it uh, however you would want to make a knife and then I'll run it on my machine. And if there's any issues, we'll figure it out now before you go spend $30,000 on a CNC machine. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a hard offer to pass up. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. <laughs> so um, that's called the Virgil and that'll it's named after the Roman poet uh, Virgil. So oh, cool. it'll be maybe January, like January, February, nice. you might see it. Right um, the corner. So Very that'll be cool. cool. Yeah. Right around the corner. And then the last knife I have is going to be made here in my shop. I'll be doing all of it uh, with the exception nice. of potentially the bevel grinding. We'll probably be hard milling that, or we'll be doing uh, another grinding process that we've been talking about and kind of chasing down for the last year. And that's called the Aurelius after Marcus Aurelius. Um, and that'll be available maybe January, February as well. It really all depends on how the next couple of weeks go. Wow. Nice. Very nice. Very exciting beginning of 2024. You're kicking it off with a bang. Yeah. Well, we've been, nice. we've been chasing this down for a couple of years now. So we've spent four years talking about like how to, how to skin this cat the right way. And we've talked to a lot of other guys who do it and we've seen, you know, like guys like Bill Koenig kind of leave like a breadcrumb trail in their Instagram posts yeah. and on their stories. Right. And it's like, if you know what you're looking for, you can kind of start figuring out like how guys are doing things a certain way. So yeah. a lot of this is just like, we've seen how other guys make stuff. And so we're trying to kind of figure out like, what's the valuable part of this process. And then like, what's the fluff that you have in here or what's something that we can trim the fat on or whatever it might be. So we spent a lot of time kind of dissecting this problem and uh, we're, we're finally ready to take a crack at it. So nice. um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be a fun, fun time. We, uh, we start production on fixtures next week. So I don't know when this will come out, but with, yeah, from, from today, starting tomorrow, we should be making fixtures and starting to get parts ready for production. So it'll be a, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Nice. Sounds like some fun, some huge, huge news right there. Yeah. It's, 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 exci it's exciting for sure. Like we've, I, we've been waiting for this for a while. So yeah. finally having the, I don't even want to say the confidence. I think we're just kind of at the point where it's like, we can only talk about it so much, man. Like it's time to jump and, and make it happen. Time so, to execute. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing is, is getting that rolling. And if everything works out there, uh, we'll probably kind of pivot a little bit and we're not going to get rid of the scales entirely, but I think we'll probably make less of the scales and, and allocate more of that spindle time to folding knives. And, you know, a lot of our, our free time will probably be dedicated towards getting a folding knife and trying to build you know, that reputation within the community of a, of a high quality, you know, cutting tool. Well, Chris, that's, that's pretty much all we've got, all our questions. We just want to thank you for your time and sharing all that information. Uh, it seems like 2024 is going to be really promising for you and your business. So congratulations on that. We'll definitely be keeping an eye out and supporting all along the way. Hell yeah. Well, I appreciate that guys. And I appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Chris, for being on the show and giving us the viewers this amazing story of yours. I also wanted to thank our viewers for tuning into this week's episode of Carry Culture Podcast. Also, thank uh, congratulations to the winner of the giveaway. And stay tuned for the next giveaway, which is going to be on January 7th. If you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. And Josh will be leaving links to everything we've talked about on the show. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much to the viewers and you guys as well. Yep. Thanks, y'all. And we'll see you on the next one. Later. <laughs> <laughs>